Kathleen, I'm so curious how this is playing out from your perspective. You're seeing these miners shutting down their operations in Texas. You know, what, is this, what does this look like from inside the industry? Well, um, I think the issue of mining in Texas has been kind of fraught in both ways. As you might remember, unfortunately, there were a number of people who um, nearly froze to death in Texas earlier this year um, because of similar issues with their energy grid. And I guess Bitcoin miners and promoters um, who tout the you know, uh, greatness of, of proof of work uh, tend to argue that this is like a battery. Um, and it's really, you know, not the case, like a one-way battery is not a battery. Um, and a lot of the strength that has been argued about Bitcoin's proof of work um, is that it's sort of this source that can be tapped into, but in fact, it's just, you know, kind of a, a, a massive suck on, on the grid. How do you see this playing out? I mean, I wonder if there's an upside forcing miners to, to think about how to make the process more sustainable. Well, um, I co-founded a cryptocurrency called Tezos, which is proof of stake. Most uh, cryptocurrencies that have launched in the last few years use proof of stake, mostly because it's the best technology in class. Um, a lot of the arguments about Bitcoin and its energy uses are mostly because it's kind of like this weird vestigial organ uh, that has been attached to Bitcoin that has a uh, sort of reverence for no good reason um, from the people who usually own too much Bitcoin to uh, think about it otherwise. It's interesting because you see the proof of stake concept as it pertains to the Ethereum merge as well. And I'm wondering some of the complications around that. How does that complicate this kind of struggle between proof of stake versus proof of work and uh, the reliance on energy as it pertains to it? Well, um, if you look back at the original marketing materials for the Ethereum Foundation's fundraiser in 2014, they advertised themselves as imminently transitioning to proof of stake. Um, so they've really been talking out of both sides of their mouth for the last few years <laughs> um, when they when they discussed their eminent transition and the virtues and benefits of, of you know proof of stake versus, versus proof of worth. Um, what's interesting actually is it ties into sort of the recent market crash uh, in cryptocurrencies is that there's been this sort of uh, token called staked Ethereum that's run for the last year. It's from the Ethereum Foundation on what's called a beacon chain, and this is meant to be some sort of test for proof of stake. Um, so you can convert your Ethereum to Ethereum on this chain, the staked Ethereum, um, but not the other way around. So in theory, it, it kind of had this inflationary reward, and so people would borrow Ethereum um, and buy staked Ethereum, uh, and that took a lot of Ethereum out of circulation, which arguably increased the price, or at least had some sort of positive effect on the price. Um, but in reality, it's really no different than uh, something like Hex, uh, which, is, which is kind of a Ponzi scheme that's crashed in the last few um, weeks. Uh, which is just a token that basically pays you for freezing it. The longer you freeze it, the more you receive, so on and so forth. But it's just, it's all inflation. That's a really big statement, actually. <laughs> Kathleen, I mean, how do you think about that inflation uh, within Ethereum? And then also kind of the distortion in prices you've seen when you think about what's happening with staked Ethereum and the broader ramifications that has for the system. Well, if you look at like the last few weeks, there have been a number of different systemic crises. Um, we sort of have the cryptocurrency's own version of uh, three, hour, uh, three hours capital is long-term capital management, basically, but with crypto. Um, a lot of the reason that uh, there is so much contagion in, in the cryptocurrency space and there's been a lot of, I guess, bad deleterious effects um, has been largely because they sort of saw um, things like staked Ethereum as a sure bet. So it's not dissimilar from this, you know, smartest people in the room uh, having models that are basically predicated on nonsense. You know, how are you watching the market fallout? Obviously, we saw the Celsius bankruptcy filing. We're seeing, you know, the crypto winter get colder and colder. You know, what is your sort of prediction about how this continues to play out? Well, as your Bloomberg colleague, Joe Weisenthal, always says, it could always go down by 100%. Um, but, uh, you know, for those of us who've been in this um, industry for quite some time, it's, you know, completely unsurprising that something like Celsius would go bankrupt because, uh, you know, economics does have laws that transcend, uh, you know, the word blockchain, uh, you know, contra popular belief by some people who monitor this stuff and analyze it. But um, I do think that, you know, there are some things that were predictable. There are some things that were less predictable. For example, apparently Three Hours Capital um, made a number of equity investments. And as part of their, um, I guess, equity investments, uh, they would often offer to uh, manage the treasury for, for, for some cats. And uh, so that's, that's unexpectedly bad, um, uniquely bad, I would say. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we've just seen a lot of shakeout from things that just wouldn't have worked. And, and you really can't make a sustainable protocol or business based on the theory that number will always go up, right? Which was most people's risk model going into this.